All righty, so it looks like everyone is getting in their seats. <clears throat> well, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing tonight? All right, all right. Can I just get a resounding round of applause for the fact that it's Juneteenth, right? It's Juneteenth. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, we are here at the beautiful Mercantile Library celebrating on behalf of the Urban Consulate for our first Nano Festival, a festival of black joy, black expression, and black liberation. So thank you for being here. So I'd first like to welcome all of you joining us here in person. You know, times have been crazy. Not all of us have been able to gather in person. So I am grateful and blessed to be able to share this experience with you all. I'd also like to welcome all of our folks joining us from our live stream and from our online community. So at Urban Consulate, we bring people together to share ideas for building a more just and equitable city. And tonight's celebration, y'all, it's a celebration, okay? It's Juneteenth, a celebration in recognizing our past, cherishing our present, and building toward our future. I know we're all excited for tonight's conversation, but as we do at all Urban Consulate events, I'd like to set some intentions for this evening's gathering. And guys, that's just simply to enjoy coming together in celebration of all that adds breath, depth, and life to black joy, black liberation, and black expression. So as I mentioned before, remember we love to hear from you all tonight. So whether you're joining us online or in person, uh, don't be shy. Be thinking about questions for our Q&A portion that we're going to open up a little bit later on in the evening, OK? Moderating this evening's conversation will be none other, none other than our very own Naima Bilal. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our honored guests for the evening. Yolanda Cornelia Nikki Giovanni Jr. is an American poet, writer, commentator, activist, and educator. One of the world's most well-known African-American poets. Her work includes poetry anthologies, poetry recordings, nonfiction essays, and covers topics ranging from social issues and human relationships to literature and hip hop. Born in Knoxville, Tennessee on June 7, 1943, happy belated, Nikki grew up here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Lincoln Heights, to be exact. Y'all know we real neighborhood specific around here. So, uh, and graduated with honors in history from her grandfather's alma mater, Fisk University. She rose to fame in the late 1960s as one of the foremost authors of the black arts movement. Influenced by civil rights movement and the black power movement at the time, she has been called the poet of the black revolution. Her work is said to speak to all ages and she strives to make her work easily accessible and understood by both adults and children. Her writing heavily inspired by African American activists and artists also reflects the influences of issues of race, gender, sexuality, and the African American family. Since 1987, she has been on the faculty at Virginia Tech where she is a university distinguished professor. She has won numerous awards, including the Langston Hughes Medal, the NAACP Image Award, a Grammy Award nomination for her poetry album, the Nikki Giovanni Poetry Collection, authored three New York Times and Los Angeles Times bestsellers, and was named one of Oprah's Winfrey's 25 Living Legends. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a queen, Miss Nikki Giovanni. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thank welcome you. Thank back everybody to for coming out with this storm. You know, I uh, was just, I'm yeah. very popular in Botswana. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. When I went to Botswana, it's about 10 years ago now, maybe a little more, yeah. um, it hadn't rained in years. I mean, just dry, dry, dry. And we, you have to, to go to Botswana, you have to fly through Johannesburg. Yeah. And, then, and so we flew up, and then all of a sudden there was just cloud. And then, by the time my plane landed, and it wasn't my plane, it was the plane, and it started to rain. 
And by the time they got me to the, it was just raining. And so everybody in Botswana thinks I'm magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Cincinnati can't feel the same way. <laughs> they're, well, but they're, they're right. I mean, you have brought with you rain, but you've also brought like, oh, after the rain, there's always the, 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 the air and there's always the, oof, the thickness. So thank you for bringing, um, for bringing the rain. No, I'm glad to be home. And one of the reasons that I was so glad when, when this came up and I was invited to the Mercantile, and I've, I've spoken here before, but one of the reasons I was so glad is that uh, I knew that I would also get Skyline Chili three ways. <laughs> 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 and there's not much I wouldn't do for Skyline. And so I was like, oh, yeah, and a little hot sauce. So when you're not in Cincinnati, though, how do you get your Skyline? I, I suffer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like any other alcoholic or whatever. I'm not an alcoholic, but you know how people just wait. You know, like, summer will be here. Summer will be here because we come out for the tennis, and of course, Skyland is there, yes. and uh, the the hot sauce. You know, your former president, uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> well, <laughs> was that? Barack Obama. You know, when he was running for presidency, uh, did what everybody he had to go through Louisiana. You go to New Orleans, and when you go to New Orleans, everybody has to eat. Some of you may know at Dookie Chase. Now, Dookie is dead. He's gone. He went to Paris, but he died. But Leah Chase still runs, and it's still Dookie. And so Barack Obama's people, I don't know if Barack knew, but Barack Obama's people knew that you have to go to Dookie Chase. So he goes into Dookie Chase, and he makes an order. And the order was not a bad order. He did okay. But when it was delivered, he said, can I have some hot sauce? Now, for those of you who've been to Dookie Chase, you know, Miss Chase does not come from around the corner for anybody. And she walked around that counter and said to this Negro, don't nobody put nothing in my food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he looked up, it was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, that's how he got the Negro vote. He finally learned, do not, <laughs> do not put hot sauce in a black woman's food. He learned that day. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. But I do put a little hot sauce in my, my skyline. <laughs> But they're not running for office. No, so, exactly. And neither so they don't. <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, apropos, we're going to stick with food because I learned something I didn't know about you, that you're a foodie. I am a foodie, and I like to eat low on the hog. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I like pig feet, I like chitlins, and I really make, I, do, I make incredible chitlins. And the trick to chitlins, you know, you turn them inside out, pull the fat, and you have to let them cook for quite some time, and then garlic, you have to have, you know, your garlic a little. I use sea salt, but I'm getting into Himalayan salt now. Because it's yeah. so, well, it's so pretty and it's so nice. And I'm yeah. into pesto oil. So as the chitlins are actually done, yeah. I've been using just a smidgen of pesto oil, you know, just to stir it in. And as, as, as I agree with Leah, you know, and anybody sitting at my table, you don't ask for nothing, either eat it or pretend you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, so, so you have invited your favorite people to your house. What are you making? I think that if I was inviting my favorite, if it's one of those, um, uh, I th what is it? Uh, bon Appetit. Because uh, I knew uh, Don Davis when, when she was just starting in the business. Yeah. And she does that thing in the back, you know, if you can invite three of your favorite people. But if I was inviting three of my favorite people, uh, because I do, I am a good cook, and I'm a, but I'm not a chef. I'm just a, I'm a Southern cook. So you open up the pantry and whatever's there, y'all eat it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But uh, I would have a, a rack of lamb mm. because I really make an incredible, incredible rack of lamb. Ooh. And I'm learning because it's a Jewish dish, but I'm learning how to fry uh, artichokes. Mm. Yeah, it, that's like a Jewish American. And that is so pretty. And uh, yeah. probably by the time you all come to my house and I make the rack of lamb because I can either roast it or Grill it, but mm. I have, I'm beginning to learn how to make that, uh, how to fry the artichoke. Ooh, delicious. Yeah, it it's is. It's a, a far, far cry from Skyline. I'd much rather have your rack of lamb and fried <laughs> artichokes than Skyline, but. Yeah, um, down. So, you know, we are, we are here to celebrate you, uh, welcome you back home, although I understand you're in Cincinnati pretty frequently, but um, we're also here to mark Juneteenth, mm -hmm. um, and as Tim shared with us, it's, it's, 
it's yes, it's a time to remember um, liberation deferred, freedom deferred, but it's also become a time to celebrate. So can you, what, what larger meaning do you draw from Juneteenth, from this moment? Well, you know, Juneteenth really, it, it, I'm sure when we think about it, we all think about it, Juneteenth is like Christmas. And you know, there was a time when, when Jesus was born, and I like Jesus, so I'm glad he was born and stuff. Yeah. But when Jesus was born, everybody was like, oh, I don't know about that. You know, when they didn't have to, but the few people that knew, he has come to deliver us, got mm -hmm. together, and said, we're going to celebrate. And that's what they did. We celebrated this birth. And a couple of other people said, well, maybe they got a point. Maybe he is God. And they joined. And the next thing you know, 2,000 years later, mm -hmm. the world, no matter what religion you have, the world recognizes Christmas. Yeah. And we also, everybody knows whether, no matter what you believe, everybody mm -hmm. knows Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. But everybody also, sadly, knows Easter. So there are holidays that we that we know, you know, and, and I happen to like Veterans Day and I'm against war, but mm -hmm. those boys that we sent out to, 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 to kill other people for no particular reason, and then they come back home and we don't even want to give them a place to live mm -hmm. or a job, or we don't want to give them health care, we don't want to take care of their families. I think we ought to celebrate the veterans because they did the dirty work for the rich guys who stay home and, and, and take their, their <laughs> rockets up. That's the truth. So, I think Juneteenth is going to be, it's growing. I remember when Juneteenth started. And it was, again, just a couple of people saying, oh, we're going to have Juneteenth. And we're going to, and so what's Juneteenth? And now, I mean, look at us here. We had a storm, but look at us. We're here celebrating Juneteenth. But it's being celebrated in all 50 states. And if we were sitting in Paris right now, June 19th, mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's June 10th. If we were sitting in London mm -hmm. or Cairo, you know, it's June 10th. And it's beginning to be a holiday that everybody mm -hmm. recognizes. And yeah. everything that black people do, I really, one of the reasons I like black people is that whatever we do, everybody else wants to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, Inimitable, it, though. It, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, we do the, you know, let's twist again like we did last summer. It doesn't matter what it is. Everybody wants to do it. <laughs> but Juneteenth is growing, and people are celebrating Juneteenth. What we don't seem to know about the Juneteenth mm -hmm. is whether we're going to celebrate it with, with music, with, with whether it's going to be spirituals, and I happen to like jazz, so mm -hmm. bringing those two things together, or food. But because food, again, yeah. and I just think you, you have to have the food. I mean, Absolutely. if it's Thanksgiving, you have to have a turkey. And I feel so I don't eat turkey because I always felt sorry. Not for the turkey who's being slaughtered, and, and, or as I like to point out, murdered, but for the turkey who's left behind. Mm. Yeah, because that's a sad turkey. The turkey's just being slaughtered. And, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm G Jesus is on the cross, I ain't they gonna get me. So that turkey's going on to heaven, but the one that's left behind. <laughs> Don't you want? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You worry about that, that's the one. That's the sad turkey. I mean, now they have, how come I'm here and my friend is gone? Mm. And I did just retire, by the way. But uh, congratulations! I, I taught, thank you. I taught it at. Uh, I thought I'd quit before they, they fired me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that turkey that lived mm -hmm. comes to Virginia Tech, and they 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 call themselves studying it. Now I'm just a poet, but I, you don't have to study to know that that's a sad turkey, that they lost their friend. Mm -hmm. And what they need is to make another friend. So they need, as we all do, when you lose something, you need something to embrace. You, mm -hmm. you need a family, you need somebody to bring you in. I said that, the vet school is like, well, Nikki, I'm not sure we've studied that. I thought, I'm just a poet, but hell, mm -hmm. even I know that. You lose something, you want something to love. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we're gonna bring, and they are at Virginia Tech, and we are studying how they, they are studying how the turkeys, wow. how they feel. Yeah. But I, I know how they feel because we've all, I don't know in this room, but I know I've lost yeah. people. And when you lose people, you're sad. They, you, you don't have to be smart to know that. You don't have to go yeah. to college to know that. Is it, is it you know, anybody like... knows that you lose something, damn it, you're sad. Yeah. And, and you want somebody to care about you. So that's our job. And I think our job is to find what turkey, but again, they, nobody listens to me, let me tell you. I think we need to find what they listen to. Mm -hmm. What is the sound? Mm -hmm. Now for me, if I'm gonna lose somebody, which I hope I never do, I'm gonna want a saxophone, I'm gonna want a little jazz, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. 
that, that's what I, I don't want, and I'm not against hip hop, you know, I, I, I know some of those people, and they're okay, but <laughs> I, I know, I, I, want, I want jazz, I want some music that, that will comfort me, and we need to know what do turkeys hear mm. that brings them that, that comfort of, that's what my friend and I listen to. Mm. We know whales, if we study, if we study whales, and some of you, you know, you got a great zoo here, so I hope everybody's going to the zoo. But you know, we know that the whales sing to each other, and we know that the loss of a whale, they sing to each other to try to comfort each other. We know some things we know. Yeah. And so in knowing that, we have to bring that, yeah. which is a long answer to how does that have to do with Juneteenth, but we're gonna find the music. Yeah. And the music is gonna come back to the spirituals mm. and to the jazz. It's gonna come back to that level because that has brought us the 200 years or, or more. That's what gave us strength to go on. And mm -hmm. it's gonna be that music that, that continues to make us strong. Yeah, and I mean, and it's, when, when you look at your own body of work, uh, you, you are celebrating 50 years of, of um, the, the truth is on its way. Truth is on its way, yeah. And it's an iconic album. And um, in so many ways, it's iconic because it's really, I mean, it's really a predecessor to hip hop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's rhythm and poetry, yeah. but it's specifically a spiritual. Mm -hmm. And when you look at your, the, how you blended those two art forms together, what, did it seem revolutionary to you then? And as you look at the trajectory today of hip hop artists, what they've done, so, you know, words under a beat, how, how have you appraised modern day hip hop? I, uh, uh, you know, I just turned, uh, somebody wished me happy birthday, happy but birthday. I just turned 79. And so what I'm, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely recommend 79, so for any of you all <laughs> who are kids, but I'm just not ever, I, 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 I was a fan of uh, Tupac, yeah. and I have a... Thug life, I have that's thug right. Life. It's the only tattoo I have, but um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not into it. I don't know how to say it. I'm, I'm not against it, and I was thrilled. And my, my class, I was still working last year, Beyonce called, and it just happened to be one of those calls that I, I always have my phone. My phone is turned off right now but the call, and it was from Beyonce. And so I, I took it because it was Beyonce. <laughs> As one does. You have to take her call. But my class was in this, like you all, and I have a class of like, you know, 15 students, 20 students, and they, they heard that, oh, you know, you know Beyonce. I said, well, I know Beyonce, but uh, she wanted me to read a poem, to, you know. And so the, the answer to that was, of course. And I appreciate what the kids are doing. And, and that's a long way to say it. I do, I appreciate it. But then there are other things that I, 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 I worry about R. Kelly, I think he's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, oh, he should be in jail. But oh, he is. that other yeah. fool, uh, Kanye West, should be in a hospital. Mm. Oh, he's mentally gone. He hasn't been worth a damn since his, his mother died. And am I right? I'm right. And so I, um, I'm, I'm not there. I think that they, 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 there's a lot of whining going on in hip hop that hmm. shouldn't be. Hmm. Whereas if we go back to the spirituals, there was no whining in the spirituals. Mm. They did say things like, pass me not, O gentle savior. But yeah. that was, that was a, 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 an, an, they were asking. They were not pleading. Or they were saying, which I love, I'm leaning on the ever. Lasting. I love that. Mm. The everlasting arms. Not the sometimes the arms. Mm -mm. Not the arms when I feel. The everlasting, I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. Yeah. Well, just humming that will, will give you, make your day. Oof. And I think as Juneteenth grows, we're going to come back into those spirituals mm -hmm. and what they have to give us. And frankly speaking, without going into anybody's religion, because I have no interest in anybody's religion, church is incredibly important. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because if church didn't do anything else, it teaches you to stand up, speak loudly, hold your head up. And I've been, I was teaching for almost 40 years, 33, 34 years. 
And I could always tell the kids who had been to church, who went to church, and the kids who didn't, because the kids who went to church always stood up and read their poems. And the kids who were not church kids, you know, and they mumbled, and they always had something crazy to say. And you could always, no, because in church, you got up every Sunday. I grew up in the AME church with my mother and Baptist church with my grandmother. And every Sunday, you got up and you read a poem or you read a chapter, or it was Mother's Day, Father's Day, Uncle's Day. It, today, the sun did shine. Today, it didn't matter. <laughs> but you got up and said something. Mm -hmm. And you learned that in Sunday school, and yeah. you brought that with you. And you, you took that forward. And I, I, think, that, uh, I think that the hip-hop kids are missing a lot because they're thinking that somebody is putting something on them that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that it's important, first of all, that you read your own Bible. And I, I'm a big fan. I think the Bible is good. It, it, it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, I think Jesus is interesting. And I think that it's kind of important that people remember Jesus didn't love everybody. He didn't. Everybody like, oh, Jesus loves me. Yeah. No, he just didn't give a damn about you. You didn't hear him say, <laughs> he doesn't. You, you didn't hear him say one word. He knew Judas was a fool. You didn't hear him do one thing to say to Judas, you know, well, listen, I understand, man, you needed the money. He didn't have anything to say to Judas because he knew Judas was a traitorous fool. Mm. I could say Donald Trump is the same thing. It, cause you, well, we know that's right. <laughs> There's no doubt well, about that. You see what Judas did, Judas realized I'm a fool. I'm gonna go and hang myself because look at what I've done. I have trade I am a traitor to the guy, to the Lord who came to save us. Donald Trump ought to do the same thing. He ought to wake up one morning. Mm. Mm. He should. I mean that just would be the right thing. Little note. Sorry, I fucked up. <laughs> Donald Trump. It would be So what what is the <laughs> Oh. How Am I allowed to say that? No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's the element of, of one fool, but what happens when you have one fool followed by <laughs> throngs of, yeah. so how do, how do you navigate in a country beset by that kind of divisiveness where it really, you know, he represents white grievances for millions of people. So how do you navigate a world where that, that, that positionality and that sentiment and that, I don't know, sensibility is, is what attracts millions of people? What do you do with that? I, I don't know about millions of people now. All I can honestly say, mm. I know I can't change the world. I, I couldn't change the world when I was 25 and thought I could. I can't change the world, but I know that I'm not going to let the world change me. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, That's really beautiful. I come from good people, some of yeah. whose names I know. Mm -hmm. I know my grandmother, I know my great grandmother, and I was looking at my arms. I have very small, but my arms are my great grandmother's arms. Her name is Cornelia, and we called her Mama Dear. And I was looking at a poster, we have a photograph of Mama Deer. And I was looking at her, I was telling Jenny as I was looking at Mama Deer's photo. And I realized my arms are exactly Mama Deer's arms. Huh. But if we go back to, to, to the ancestors I don't know, yeah. these are good people. Yeah, yeah. And so all I can do is, know, is be faithful to the people who were good and who wanted something more for me. Mm. And I don't know if that's making, but for those of us who are college graduates, because I always laugh, I was laughing recently, uh, I spoke at a graduation. And you know, at graduation, you know, you hear yappity, yakity, yak, and it's all crap. And then, you know, you walk across the stage and you take the picture, but then everybody throws their, 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 their... Graduation yeah, cap. Yeah, up mm -hmm. in the air. And I, I said to, to the, do you know why you do that? And so they all looked at me because they don't know why. I said, because the people sitting in heaven had wanted you to learn how to read mm. when it was against the law, when it would get you blinded or killed to know how to read. And now you're graduating and you're throwing your cap up so that they can sit up in heaven and say, that's my baby, she, mm. she graduated. That's who you throw that up for. That's who you graduate for. That's who you show. And when, he, when, when that person sitting in that, and it's usually a little old lady sitting in heaven, 
and she's looking at, that's my baby, and mm. somebody else sitting there, well, well, that's mine, she got it, hers is higher. But those little old ladies sitting in heaven, that's who you throw that hat up to. Mm. And you have to remember who you love. That's, it's, that's yeah. awesome. You do, yeah. you just have to remember that. So you, would you, okay, so one of my favorite, my favorite, favorite poems of yours is Love Is. <laughs> I'd have to, you'd have to, <laughs> I have no idea where it is. Uh, I do better. You know, I, there was a poem I wanted to read. Yes, uh, yes. If, if, if I may. So we, we were talking earlier about how you get along with these fools we get along with. And mm -hmm. one of the things, again, that I finally realized, I'm, I'm sure many of us have here, is, you know, you look at these murders that we're having lately, 18-year-olds uh, going out buying machine guns mm -hmm. and, and, and shooting a lot of people, you know, killing people. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's, that's fear. That, that's, that's, not any, that's just fear. And I had written a poem, it's an old poem, and it's called Fear, Eat In or Take Out. And I really, uh, I don't think you've heard it lately. I think fear should be a spice, something we sprinkle on our steaks just before we put them on the grill, something we mix in with our corn muffins and bake or at 350 degrees for 20 minutes or until golden brown. Maybe we take fear leaves to decorate our apple pie right out of the oven, not before the leaves will burn and look not nearly so pretty. I'm thinking if we can learn to distill fear, we have two wonderful preparations, perfume for smells and alcohol for drinking. Perfume carries its own sense of danger and excitement, but then we throw a little fear in there, things really heat up. Ask John Edwards or Herman Cain and see if I'm not right. Mm -hmm. Fear, mm -hmm. the scent he can't resist. <laughs> We'd have to find an exclusive outlet for it. We wouldn't want everybody to be able to get their hands on it. I'll have, a, I'll have to form a committee to find that solution. Maybe the White House will have some ideas or, oh yes, the Tiger Woods Emporium. Get your fear right here. We can practice your swing, whatever that might mean, while your bottle is bagged. And if we made it drinkable, we'd probably have a light green liquid with its own two ounce top. You can take your fear out on the rocks or sip a bit of Coke in there to make it mighty smooth. We could get the culinary channel to feature fear at one of our drink offs and we'd be rewarded with the best new bartender with the, his or her very own great bottle of fear to be used anytime they'd like. I need to explain right here. It's not fear that causes problems. It's when hatred is combined with it. Mm. Fear on its own lets you not lend your, your cousin money. Don't go down that dark street, girl. Take yourself home from this party now. Fear is a warning signal. Healthy, good idea. That fish smells funny. My dog does not like this man. Fear is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's why I want to keep it exclusive. If anyone, if everyone can have fear, then we have to cut it, like drugs. It's like cocaine that, every, that kills you. It's the stuff that if you cut it, that's, it's the stuff you cut it with that makes the drugs go further. You don't want pure fear, but you don't want to cut it with hatred either. Hatred is a bad idea, which is why it is cheap and available anywhere you look. Maybe mm -hmm. what we really work on, what we really work is well with is a need to have a fear tree in our backyard or a small fear plant growing on our apartment windowsill. When we are feeling uneasy, we pluck a few leaves and find the right place to put them. Champagne usually would, <laughs> champagne usually would be the, the number one cho choice, but spaghetti works well too. Have a little fear at least once a week and you will build up your resistance, mm -hmm. like a vaccination that once wars and hatreds come along, you'll be able to recognize that's just another expression of fear. No thanks, I had mine today. Mm. That's what I'm thinking we really need, an antidote for fear. Mm. An antidote for fear. But you, you said something within that poem is the idea that when hatred is combined with fear, um, that's where you have problems. And what happens when power and hatred and fear, because when we look at, you know, the January 6th, we have an entire segment, throngs 
of American citizens who looked at that and said, yeah, that sounds about right. But th when you think about the hatred combined with the power and the fear, that's when it feels like power. there's no safety. Yeah, no, no, funny, power is a, um, a funny word in, in, in my opinion, because what happened January the 6th was not, it was fear, mm -hmm. but it wasn't power. Mm -hmm. Because my dog, my, my son, who's a sweet guy, some of you know my son Thomas, and he just bought a house. And I wanted to go, he lives, he says New York, but I think New York is Manhattan. And if it didn't Manhattan, it ain't New York. So <laughs> <laughs> he lives way out. And, I'm, and it's because you're talking about power. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they bought, he and Trace, his, his wife, bought, they bought a, a house and he invited me out. And I took a car out, thank God. And it took me an hour, took the, the driver an hour and 40 minutes to get there. And I go in, and he's got the dog. Dog is 80 pounds. My dog is, is eight pounds, not seven pounds. Mm -hmm. I have a little Yorkie, but he's got a big dog. Mm -hmm. And the dog is Arbus, is crazy. I don't know why he couldn't name him something that makes sense. But when I walked in the house, the dog is very protective of Thomas mm -hmm. and got in front of Thomas and growled. And I looked at the dog and I said, I am your grandmother. <laughs> Now you move. <laughs> and the dog looked at me, thought about it, and got out of the way. Mm. That was power. That's power. <laughs> That's right. What do they call that? Walking softly, and, carrying and a big was, stick? Yeah, that was power. <laughs> and the dog knew I went, I'm your grandmother, get the hell out. But mm -hmm. it would have been fear if mm -hmm. I had pulled out my gun and shot him. Right. Mm -hmm. You yes. see what I'm saying? I, I, don't, yes. had, I don't have a gun. But. Mm -hmm. If I did, that would have been fear. Mm -hmm. And it would not have been power. Mm -hmm. And somebody would say, well, I'm powerful because I shot the, anybody can shoot them. Mm -hmm. But it was power when I said, I am your grandmother, move. Mm -hmm. This is my son, this is not your son. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, that's power. So we have to be careful how we use that word. Yeah. And I really hate supremacy because we talk about white supremacists and white, if they were supreme, they would have power. Mm -hmm. And if you have power, you don't have to have any kind of violence yes. to go with it. It, it just doesn't, you don't. And it, it's what makes black Americans confusing to white Americans, and not each and every, but it's what makes them, because we have the power, yeah. and we have kept over 200 years the power. And somehow or another, they still don't know, why, how come them people are still smiling, damn it? We have shot them, we have bombed them, we have killed them. How come they still, how come they still come up with a, a song? How come they still come up with a dance? How come when we bomb their church, they rebuild it? Mm. That's power. Mm. We say, you, you can do what you want to do. And I was thinking about Fannie Lou, we were talking about Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi. Yeah. How come we can beat Miss Hamer the way that they did? And she still said, I'm gonna vote. Mm. Until the day she died, and she died in Nashville, Tennessee, some of you know, in, at the Vanderbilt Hospital. Until the day she died, somebody carried her to the polls so that she could vote. That's power. Mm. Yeah. And we have to understand what is power, mm. and what is fear, and what is hatred. Mm. And we have to be careful, we who are poets particularly, yes. about how we use the words. Yes. Because we're letting them get away with some words mm. that's not true. <laughs> that's not power. Yeah. What, what, what happened is not power. What, what they did in Buffalo to shoot people at, at a grocery store, there's nothing powerful about that. Mm -mm. But it's even worse in a way, not that I'm not denying, yeah. but it's even worse to go into a school yeah. with children who have no, you know they can't fight back. Yeah. There's not a kid in that classroom that's gonna pull out a gun and, and fight back, not a teacher and a couple of teachers gave up their lives. Mm. That's not power that you could walk in with an AR-15 and shoot them. What makes that powerful? Mm -mm, it's cowardice. And Jesus don't mm -hmm. love you. You're going to hell. Mm. <laughs> I know somebody, no, because they want to, oh, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus didn't die for my sins. Mm -mm. I don't know about yours, but I know that mm -hmm. you, what I think Jesus died for, and that's why I say you have to read your own Bible. This is not Nikki's talk on Jesus. But I think what Jesus, was on that cross to show us mm. was that it don't mean nothing. Mm. So he's on that cross, he said, yeah, you think you can kill me? Call me in 2,000 years. Mm. 
He's, he's still alive. We're still worshiping him. Mm -hmm. he, death ain't nothing. That's power. Said, you think you're scaring me? Mm -hmm. You ain't scaring me. Mm -hmm. Go talk to somebody else. I'm doing my job. I'm showing you. Mm -hmm. Death is a normal thing, and some fool is going to try to kill you. But there's nothing to be afraid of. I'll be there. Mm. I got your back. Which is why when he came from the tomb, remember? And he came out, was the first person. He went to see Mary Magdalene. Mm. Didn't he? Because people were going to talk about Mary Magdalene. Because they were going to try to make her, oh, you're a bad woman. And so Jesus just wanted to say to her, you know, girl, it, it might be hard sometimes, but I got your back. Got your back. Right? Everlasting. That's what he said, mm -hmm. didn't he? He went to take it, so Mary Magdalene didn't, didn't have to worry because she knew he didn't die. For, she didn't have a sin. The sin was the people that was against it. Mm -hmm. But he wanted her to know, I got your back, baby. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. And that's what I like about Jesus. He was picky about who he talked to. Yes. <laughs> Very choiceful. He was. I like that. Because you know, mm -hmm. as my grandmother's favorite song, it is well with my soul. Yes. There's a reassurance there. So when there. you talk about power, mm -hmm. you talk about that man on the cross some 2,000 years ago, mm. and we're still talking about it. Yeah. They thought they killed him. We don't know the soldier. We don't know who hid the hand. We don't know, very, but we know he's still alive. Mm. And I like that about Amen. Jesus. Amen. I like that. So I kind of want to stay on... A slight, like a slightly spiritual tip, and I learned another thing about you, which is just like I, it's these discoveries. And so we're going to talk about discovery. Um, but you had an album collaboration with Javon Jackson of your namesake, the Gospel according to Nikki Giovanni, yeah. and you sing, you sing on this album, yeah. and so yes. She sings on the album. No, I, I'm not a singer. <laughs> what, what did you discover? Because, you, you know, you said you're not a vocalist. So what did you discover about yourself singing? Well, we did, the album came up because I was at Javon Jackson, who used to play, for those of you who are jazz fans, with uh, uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. And Javon was the 17-year-old saxophonist in the back. So, you know, when Mr. Blakey died, you know, Javon had to go on, and he, he's a really bright, and he's really good, and now he teaches, he, the, he's at the uh, uh, um, Hartford School, yes. and he has the, the jazz, he teaches the jazz at the Jazz Institute, he's very, very good at that, and he invited me up, and I was like, well, yeah, because I know Art Blake, and I was happy to do it, but as I said to him, he also bullied the president of the college to giving me an honorary degree. <laughs> And he, he said, I didn't bully him. I said, yeah, Jermon, you, you bullied him. Because eh? I know he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. And so we did that. But when, when I went up, they were playing one of the, you know how you, music, and they were playing some spirituals. And I said, oh, you know, it's, it's so nice. I really love, because I do, I really love the spirituals. And he said, so do I. And, you know, you chit-chat, and he has a student, and I remember him, and I don't remember many names of anything. But uh, after we did this ceremony, I got a degree and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. the student went down, he had a baby grand, mm -hmm. and the student sat down, his, his name's Michael, and started playing, and then we all started singing. Now, I cannot sing, which it, when you hear the album, you'll know that, but we all started singing, and it was with, Javon said, you know, we ought to do something together. And I said, I'd be delighted, which I was, it'd be fun, you know, to do that. And he said, why don't you send me 10 or 12 of your, your favorite, uh, gospel, as she said, mm -hmm. and mostly it's, they are spirituals. And I said, yes, but there was one because Nina Simone was a good friend, and I really love Nina, and I think, you know, I guess, it, 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 I guess it's fair to say, uh, somebody can take it back, but two of the, of, of my sorority sisters, I'm a Delta, of course, yeah. and ooh, yes. <laughs> But two of my sorority sisters uh, that I wish I could have done s something more for. One was Aretha, who was, you know, people forget Aretha was a Delta. And uh, the other was Nina Simone. And we were very, I was closer, I knew Re. I mean everybody, not everybody, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I was close to Nina. I, I would drive up to her house and, you know, we would, I was a coffee drinker then. I didn't start drinking alcohol until I went to Virginia. You go to Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Academia will do that to you. You go to Virginia. Anybody go to Virginia, you're going to drink something. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but 
I would go up and you know talk to Nina and talk with Nina. Listen, most of I listen a lot, and I'm not a good listener. I, I really think you probably know that because we had lunch today. <laughs> and um, I, <laughs> no, we did. There, there's, I'm a good person to talk to because I don't remember, and so you could tell me anything you wanted to, because I wouldn't remember and couldn't repeat it. And so. I know, I know a lot of famous people. I, I, I'm sure that if I could ever think of the shit I know, I could write a book that would be just <laughs> number one bestseller. But, but I would talk to Nina, and I happened to know that I did remember that one of her favorite songs was Night Song. Mm. And a lot of people don't know Night Song. Some of you do. It's, it was the thing, the, the basic song of a, a, a play called Golden Boy. And actually, Golden Boy was starring Sammy Davis Jr. And for those of you who remember Sammy Davis Jr., you remember him from Sporting Light, where he had clothes on. But in Golden Boy, he played a boxer. And Mr. Davis must have weighed 50 pounds. I mean, he, it, <laughs> you, think, you think I'm kidding. To see Sammy Davis Jr. in a pair of boxing shorts was the funniest thing you ever saw in your life. But Golden Boy had the song, Night Song, and it was so beautiful. But Nina loved it. And so I said to, 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 to Javon, if we do this, mm. I would like to have night song, mm. and I would like to sing it because Nina, as we know, is gone. I, so I'd like to sing it. I'd like to sing it for yeah. for Nina. And he said, "Fine." I didn't, by the way, name the album. Yeah. Uh, okay. Javon named the album, and he named it the Gospel according to me because I picked the tunes. Mm. Mm. But the one tune that is not a traditional gospel is um, night, night song. song. So mm -hmm. I get to in be introduced. And I was, we made our debut yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we were in uh, uh, New York at Brooklyn Academy of Music. Yes. And he introduced me, and this is Nikki Giovanni, our vocalist. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> 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 I'm a vocalist, but uh, I, I don't think I've been, I, I was so nervous to tell you the truth. But uh, do you, did, do you I, I'm gonna get used to, I'm gonna do, we're going out, his grandmother lives in Denver, so we're yeah. going out to Denver. And hmm. we will, I, I think I'll be a little more relaxed. Uh, I hope I am. That I was being, yeah. Everybody said you did okay, but I think everybody's being nice. But I sang Night Song, and, and I got yeah. all the words, and, and that was <laughs> the main thing. But I wanted to sing that for Nina, because a lot of people really don't know Nina. And it's just my way of helping us to remember, really, a great woman. Mm -hmm. And we all know Aretha, and, you know, so, but I think we forget how wonderful, well, two people, uh, and Connie's sitting here, and, and, and she had a cousin that worked with uh, 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 Billy Holiday, and I think two of the great voices were, were, were Billy Holiday and, and, uh, and Nina, yeah. and so I wanted to sing that, and so mm. on number three, <laughs> I'm singing Night Song. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Check it out, y'all. I'm not going to say what it's on. Just go buy it. <laughs> Don't stream it. Buy the album. Um, I'm, you, I'm sure you can get it. So, yeah. um, I never say that to people, you know, because yeah. uh, I'm a big thief myself. I'm sure that it's on uh, <laughs> <laughs> Zoom. Or it's, on, it's on all the things. I was, uh, and and I'm, I'm just so, I'm, I'm proud of myself, if I may say so, for all of us who are old women. I'm just proud that at my age, I still didn't mind making a mistake. Mm. And I think that that's what's, as an artist, I see Ke Kevin Harris is here, he's an artist I know, and you just keep not being afraid of making a mistake. Mm. And you just never worry, really, about what people might think of what it is mm. you're doing. You're just gonna do it, and you're gonna look at it, and you're gonna be happy, and your mother's gonna be happy, or your good friend is gonna be happy, because they're gonna lie anyway. And they oh, that's really nice, because <laughs> they, they were made to lie. Mm. Oh, you did really good. And you know, you, you don't pay any, the, the rest of the people don't know, because the people that you love, Peggy's gonna say that, oh, honey, this is the best you've ever done. And that's, Jenny's gonna say that. And that that's, 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 that's what the people we love are about, and the rest of the people, we don't give a damn. And, <laughs> You, you have to be willing to take the chance on being, yeah. you know, and I thought, well, I know I'm not a singer, and <laughs> my, my main, what, what I missed, if you ever do hear it, is, uh, it, it's called the bridge. You're a singer, so you know. I miss that, well, you are, you, <laughs> and I miss that bridge. I, I didn't know how to keep 
they said I was singing in C. I, I wouldn't know C from a hole in the ground. And <laughs> when I got to the bridge, I changed a note and went down, and then I came back. I don't know. But I wanted to sing. I sang, the woman I sang it for is sitting in heaven going, mm -hmm. I told that girl she couldn't sing. So <laughs> 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 I'm sitting there, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted to sing that for Nina, and um, I did. I, 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 I don't think that I'll ever try to do, you know, I'm, I'm not a singer, and mm -hmm. I know some really good singers, and I have some ideas, so I would like to hear some things sung, yeah. but uh, what I do here is things that go together, yeah. and I wrote a, um, a poem for my, my granddaughter. Yeah. I have a granddaughter. She can't believe she's 16. She can drive a car. I mean, who can, <laughs> can you, yeah, <laughs> and, you know, that kind of next one, like, Mama Nick, Grandma Nick, you know, I, I, I have my driver's license. I said, if you think that means I'm supposed to buy you a car, you know, you don't know, you don't know what poets make for a living. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm hearing that. It's, a, it's I'll read it. Yes, Can I, please. I'll read it. And uh, I kept hearing it, and it really does go with, and we are going to record it. It goes with um, uh, a, a, a gospel called... Uh, uh, the Everlasting Arms. Mm. And I grew up in a um, Baptist church, so church was opened with, you know, what a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the ever sting, you know, so you do know, and that's what they would open the church. And so I wrote this poem for, her name is Kai, what if Kai actually? I think I'm afraid of growing old. Yeah. My eyesight will fail. I won't be able to jump rope. When I turn my CD on, I won't know Miles Davis from John Coltrane and may not recognize Bill Evans from Thelonious Monk. No one will want to be around me because I will be sad about what I've lost. I do have a couple of potatoes, though, and a yellow onion. I think there is a turnip and maybe some fr frozen peas, and surely I have some garlic cloves. I hope there's a piece of ham hock, a can of tomatoes, and, if any luck, a yellow and green squash. Always there is a stalk or two of celery, and of course, three or four carrots. Maybe I'll have a granddaughter who will cuddle under the quilt our grandmothers, hers and mine, made, who will read Mrs. Frisbee and the, and the Rats of Nim to me again, while the vegetables she has carefully chopped and put in a chicken broth will drift over like sunny clouds to tickle our knows. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. And I, mm. I just, you can hear that because after that it's going to come leaning on the everlasting because that's, that's all we're saying, you know, oh. right there. And well, so, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, and I recommend granddaughters too. I, I, mm. I have a son and I'm, I'm glad, but I, I definitely recommend granddaughters. Yeah. yeah, they're the ones I, because I do, I have a quilt and, and my my mother wasn't really a quilter, but it got passed around. But I mentioned Cornelia, but yeah. Cornelia made a quilt that Louvenia, my grandmother, made. And so we have it. And so I'm, I'm sharing that with, with Kai, you know, that uh, this is something we sit under a while. Yes. And she can chop, which I can't. I, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm not a chef, I'm just a country cook, but Kai can chop. So when you ask her to cut something, you know, like, would you cut up the uh, 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 onions or something? She can put it there and chop it. And she doesn't cut her fingers off. I, I end up with bruises all over the place, blood all over. Nobody wants to eat what I do. So I let her do all of that work. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's nice to have a granddaughter. And not the grandson. My, my son is a good cook, and I think that's why she's a good, hmm. a good cook. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it, it's, granddaughters are nice. I, I, I recommend them. Oh. It, I, it seems like you... <laughs> I Look, did. to read a lot of your poems is to read love poems. And when I hear the poem that you've written for your granddaughter, there is a fierce, ten but it's, it's tender. There's a tenderness in love. And I think about, I'm going to go back to that poem, what it, love is. Oh. But um, at the end of the poem, you say, you know, love is me and you. And so there is this intimacy yeah. that is woven throughout all of your poems. It's irresistible. Um, and the tenderness comes out and in your poems written for people you love. Yeah. Well, thank who's you. The, who's the next love poem for? Oh, I don't know. My dog, probably. Your dog? <laughs> well, I love, I, I love, yeah. uh, What's your dog's name? Cleopatra. 
Cleopatra. I love Cleo. Yeah, she, she's a good old gal. And uh, I, I think, again, uh, somebody asked me, I was doing a, um, um, I guess it was PBS show with a young woman. She just got, the show is going to be called, it, it'll be in, in it, for those of you who do PBS, it'll be on in um, September. Mm. And she's just a young woman. She's at least 30 years younger than I am. And it's called uh, Generation Anxiety. Mm. And so she called me, <laughs> which uh, I was like, you called me about Generation Anxiety. Yeah, because you know, you're old. I said, oh, thank you, sweetheart. I, <laughs> that surely encourages me to come and do your show. <laughs> but uh, she, was, she wanted to deal with what is love. And, and what mm. she said, which I think is so, you know that she's young to ask a question like that. I like her, and this, this is not against her. But she was saying, you know, well, I don't know how you find love. I said, where'd you lose it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. Well, the, you don't find it. And there's nothing in the world harder than love. Mm. It, love is a mess because love <laughs> is always, you know, somebody that you thought was wonderful. They're, they broke their foot, and you have to take care of them, and mm -hmm. they shit in the bed, and you have to change them. Mm -hmm. That's love. Yes. Honestly, I mean, I'm not, love is not that, oh, isn't he cute? That, that ain't love, that's sex. Mm -hmm. And yes. nothing wrong with sex, you can do it for a while, but there's a reason pencils have erasers. But <laughs> <laughs> love is, you know, that's a commitment. You, isn't that true? You're yes. building, love is, you're building something. Yeah. And that's what I was saying. You, you didn't lose love. It's not out there like, oh, I need to find love. Mm -mm. You have to give it. Yes. And you have to give your patience, your time. You have to give your smile. You mm -hmm. have to, we got answered. Read about the, how did they learn to love? Mm -hmm. Through 200 years of slave, 300 years of slavery. Mm -hmm. They found a way to love mm -hmm. and to share that love with us and to pass it along. This, this is what love is. You know, you, you need to turn your, your Facebook or Twit or whatever those things are. I don't have any of those things. So you can't email me. You can't, you can't reach me that. You know, people are always like, I emailed you. No, you didn't email me because I don't email. <laughs> and, uh, I don't. Because it, obviously it makes people crazy and it makes them upset and they believe things. You know, somebody write, oh, girl, you know, I had such a good time last night. Why are you telling me? <laughs> Why you I don't, care. Yes. I don't care what kind of time you had last night. Why are you telling me? Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm a big uh, uh, Bonnie Raitt fan. And oh, yes. I'm a big Bonnie Raitt fan for a couple of reasons. But one is that she has worked so hard with the blues women, as some of you know, yeah. to make sure that the black women in the blues world are getting their, 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 their share of their money. She has really. And mm. I, I just, I don't know Miss Raitt. I've never met her. But I really love Nick of Time because everything is the nick of time. You gotta know when the door opens. And you'll know when that door opens, you only have so much time to go through it. So you have to go through it and then you have to work to keep it open. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you know, that's love. That is love. That's yeah. love. And, and you have to know the difference. So, um, look, I, I'm looking at, like, I'm just gonna keep going because I feel like this is great. Um, so you, you really, uh, you, you said something earlier today about Kwame Alexander and how, you know, a young poet, you know, you, you talked about it almost like succession. Like you have to continue to pass down to new generations so that they can carry the lineage forward and carry the legacy forward. And so there are folks like Kwame Alexander, who, who are, other young poets who ignite and activate something within you that dis helps you discover something new? Who are they? Uh, Kwame Alexander is like my literary son. Mm -hmm. And I really, I just, I love Kwame so much and I hope that all of you know him. I know he's been to Cincinnati and I know out to Joe Beth. And I had the pleasure of teaching Kwame. And so I'm, I was really glad and to see that he, you know, you can teach him, but he also learned. So that was very good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's a young uh, poet right now, uh, and she writes novels also, named Renee Watson. Mm -hmm. And I really love, I don't know if you know Renee, but I hope you do, because uh, Pieces of Myself is a wonderful, wonderful book. 
And uh, again, you know, you're not doing anything. Go out to Joe Beth and, and pick it up because they've got it. And you just sit down in the cafe and read it. You know, you don't have to buy it. And try not to, sp <laughs> try not to spill any food on it and put it back, you know. <laughs> don't dog, e dog ear the pages. I, I don't, don't, don't worry about it. And uh, I work, I, I, I'm very proud of my relationship. I, I, I'm, I, I'm glad that I met her. And of course, though, she doesn't need me in any way mm -hmm. at all. But uh, clearly, one of the most brilliant writers in America mm -hmm. is now living writers is uh, Ed Witch Danica, mm -hmm. and you must know Ed Witch because uh, she's brilliant and she's a great writer. And now that Toni Morrison has gone, she, she stands there. She, she teases me because she said, you know, she used to call me Miss Giovanni all the time, and it's like, well, Miss Giovanni, Ed Witch. If we're going to be friends, you're going to have to call me Nikki. She said, you're right, Miss Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally got her. She now calls me Nikki. Mm -hmm. But uh, she is a brilliant young lady who really writes beautifully. She's Haitian, though. Mm -hmm. And I recently met another uh, young Haitian writer. And I said, you know, I'm gonna have to, I've been to Haiti several times. You have to, I'm going to have to go back and find out what it is, what, what's in the water there. Because mm. they are presenting, they are just doing really brilliant writers. <laughs> Whatever it else is going on there, yeah. they're doing uh, really, really good. Yeah. So, you know, you try to help whoever you, whoever you can. You know, you, it, yeah. there's no such thing, Thelonious Monk, and I'm a, I'm a big Monk fan. I don't know if any of you are Monk fans. I, I love Monk. And Monk, just, you know, the don't get on. And somebody once was interviewing him, and, you know, Mr. Monk, you know, you, you, you're playing some wrong notes. You know how Monk was sitting here, sitting like, and Monk said, piano ain't got no wrong notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel the same way about poems. There's no such thing as a bad poem. It's just the poem hadn't found its way yet. Mm -hmm. And so you write your poems, and who, who remember? Most of the writers were dead before their works were published. Mm -hmm. now, I'm serious, just, yeah. you can look at the history there. Most of them were gone before they were they, so you have to assume I'm writing for the future. Mm. That's the only mm -hmm. way to look at it. And you go ahead and write, and then you're dead and gone, sitting in heaven someplace, and somebody says, oh, but look, back in 2022, this was really brilliant. You mm. know, and you're sitting in heaven and saying, damn fool, I told you that. <laughs> but you have to accept that, because mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. the way that, that goes. And, mm -hmm. and being an artist, you're always going to be in front of your own genius, I think. Mm. And so you, you allow that to happen without de destroying you. Because you can't please, the, you don't even want, it would disturb anybody to have some of these people like them. Mm. You know, it, it, I don't even, I, I, maybe I've said that badly, but it, it, it would, you know, you look at some fool that can't put three words together, it's telling how wonderful you are, you know. So I like, I like my audience. I really do, because they come, they listen, and you all know my work, but, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but, you know, you can't, can you imagine you get a, a note from Clarence Thomas saying how much he enjoys your work? You'd have to shit on it and send it back. <laughs> yeah. You would have. No, that's going to be one stinky note, um, going back to Clarence Thomas. No, you, you, you have to respect people because people will say, you know, I, I, like, I like my audience. And people say, oh, I know you don't want to stand here and sign this, or I know you don't want to take a picture with me. If I didn't want to do that, what was I trying to do? Of course I do. And I, I dislike someone whose name I will not call for just that reason, because she's, she's like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, she was a singer, not, not Aretha, because Aretha's a good old gal, but she was like, you know, oh, the people are always bothering me, but then don't sing. Mm -hmm. go, go on and get yourself a rag and work in the, in, in the toilets in the airport. Mm -hmm. Then nobody will bother you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I just, yeah. I have a lot of respect and love for the people, mm -hmm. and I think that that's, that's all, that, that's what you want to do, and if you can help somebody, yeah. then you, you're happy to do it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. I, oh, I'm so happy to hear that because I would love uh, an ussy after this. I'm um, glad to know you're open to that. Not a um, so the, the, the revolution. So when, when I remember as 
you know, in school, in grade school. They had us recite ego tripping. Uh, yeah. And to see black children taking up space in that way was just, it was the first time in any literary work, frankly, and I went to a school, mostly white teachers, but to have white teachers have us recite this poem that invited us to take up space and feel confident, um, revolutionary. Uh -huh. And so I, I wanna thank you for that oh, and give well, you your you. flowers for that. And talk about, you know, learning, learning in schools, we, we anti-CRT laws, book bans that may or may not prevent children, black children, brown children, children of color, from seeing themselves and feeling affirmed in the things that they read, what gives you any hope that that kind of culturally affirming and responsive content in classrooms can continue to breathe life into children? Because your work certainly had that impact on me as a child. Thank you. You, you mentioned black children, brown children, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to include yellow and white children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we often forget that though black children, we're black, so we, we see segregation this way. But white children have to be taught. And that's, and South Pacific is not my idea of a great play. Okay, let's start with that. It really isn't one of my favorite. But one of the songs is you've got to be carefully taught to hate before you are six or seven or eight. Mm -hmm. So these mm -hmm. children have to be taught to hate. And of course, County Callan wrote one of the great poems while riding once in Baltimore, heartfelt, head filled with glee. I saw a Baltimorean, it's sitting, uh, staring straight at me. Now I was eight and very small and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he stuck out his tongue and called me nigger. Mm -hmm. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there. That's all that I remember. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of, I love the county Cullen, one of the great poets in America. And now people say, well, we don't want to say nigger. Well, if we take the N word, if we say, while riding once in Baltimore, it won't work. He wrote the poem a certain way. And I'm not going to let anybody, I, re I recite, it's one of the few poems that I can recite, and it's not even mine. But I'm not going to let somebody tell me what can be said and what I should say and who I should say, because they said, well, black people can say nigger, but not white people. So then we have to say, who's white? Mm -hmm. Now we have a question, we have a problem. We have a real problem with that, because rich white people in the old days of, of slavery, when their wives got pregnant and they had the babies, would send down into the, 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 the uh, uh, slave quarters mm -hmm. for who was pregnant, who had a baby, who, who in other words, who had milk and would make them, now some of you know this history, mm -hmm. and would make the, the black woman would come up, so her child is going to have to ha find another way, but she had to come up and feed the white kid, right? Now, I don't have a problem with that. It's mean, but I don't have a problem with that. But this is what, it, what I do know, and this is why I share this. You are what you eat. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we talk about who's white. How the hell does anybody know? And so you, you, we have to recognize that <laughs> none of this has worked the way people thought it would work. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the kids, you know, ego tripping or anything, and I like ego tripping, I'm glad, I'm, I'm thrilled. But I think that the kids need to hear all of it. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people don't know I know why the cage bird scene comes from Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who mm -hmm. is our neighbor in, 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 in Dayton. And Maya was a friend, and, and that's the truth. I don't have a problem with, with Maya. <laughs> the only thing that Maya ever and I, we ever had a disagreement about, she thought she could cook, and I know I can. So, <laughs> uh... <laughs> I'm a better cook than Maya, and that's the truth. Okay. And she's sitting up in heaven saying no. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people don't know that I know why they, they, they don't know Paul Lawrence Dunbar is our neighbor. Mm. He, he, that, that poem came from Paul. And it's that kind of thing that you want 
everybody yes. to know. You want Ohioans to be, a, to be proud yes. of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Yes. He was the first poet that recognized, that showed us, of all of the poets, period, of any color, that you can make a living writing and reading your poetry. Mm -hmm. He bought a home, and, it's, and he bought a home for him and his wife, and he bought his mother a home next to it because that's what he was able to do, which a lot of poets today won't even do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But we want, to, we, we want to, to let the kids, let all of the kids know this is something we all yes. should be proud of. Absolutely. And so we teach it to everybody. Yes. Of course we want the black kids, and I don't have a problem with that at all, of mm -hmm. course. <laughs> but we also want the white kids. You know, when, when you see a little white girl, a little blonde, braided hair, mm -hmm. and you, I was born in the Congo. It, it, it delights me <laughs> because if you, you, know, you wonder where the human beings come from anyway. And of course there's the, the theory, I'm a space freak, but there's the theory that the universe, the galaxy I should say, yes. was built on sound. And so there's a, a, he's a Harvard professor who says that it was sound coming together that created the universe. I think it must be true because when you hear sound, we just had a big storm here, and you see that lightning, and you get that, you know something is coming. So it's really, to me, it's really interesting. So he's writing that it's sound that created. If sound created the, in, the, the, the galaxy, we are the people who have carried mm. the sound. Mm. We are the people who have carried the sound with our song, with our feet, with our snapping our fingers, with our pop. Black people, black, no, not even black people, in all fairness, and I'm not against anybody, but black Americans mm. have carried that sound and we carried it around the world. Yeah. And if the earth, it's why NASA right now, as some of you know, and any of you have children, I, I hope you're aware of it, they are asking, particularly black women, they are trying to recruit black women into the space program. And you might say, why? It's because everybody knows, not just poets, everybody knows in the whole galaxy if anybody can get along with anybody, mm. it's black women. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's right. That's it. Yeah. We, we have gotten along with everybody. And I said that to Javon. He plays tenor sax. I said, Javon, if I could go in, into outer, outer space, I would want you to go with me. And he said, well, why? I said, because you could play your sax. And whatever life form is out there, they're going to come because everybody loves a saxophone. Mm -hmm. Everybody, somebody goes, oh, that sounds like John Coltrane. Well, that sounds a little bit like Prez. And so this life mm -hmm. form would come. And I'm a black woman. I'd be standing there and say, baby, did you, did you have something to eat today? Because that's what black women do. You, you meet them and they're like, you know, baby, can I get you something to eat? You need to. Yes. And that's what would make us. Mm. Because we send other people into space and they see an alien and they like, kill it. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a fear again. Yeah, but mm -hmm. we wouldn't be doing that. We'd be like, yeah, yeah, baby. I got a daughter you ought to meet. Yes. I like black men. <laughs> We're wonderful people. <laughs> you, um, you talked about being a space freak. Is that the word you use? Do you, do you ever read um, fiction, like sci-fi fiction, like Octavia Butler or N.K. I, I do read Miss Butler, of course, I mean, yes. because uh, she's wonderful. And I loved Kindred. But I read very little uh, yeah. fiction. I, mm -hmm. My science is science, yes. and I've always been interested, of course, I'm interested in what is space because the water evaporates, mm. right? And I'm interested in what is holding the ocean. And uh, I share that with a lot of science. We, we, we don't know what, we have not been that low. We don't know what is below. Yes. We, we know that things sink and sink and sink, but we know if you, all you have to do is turn your faucet on, you cannot hold water. Something is holding the water. Mm. And so we keep trying to go down and down and down. And it's going to take, in all fairness, again, I, I say this in all love, but it's going to take an Appalachian because the Appalachians are only really strong people who will say, oh, hell yeah, I go to the bottom of the ocean and give a damn. And they go on because they, they've been poor all their lives. They've been hungry. They ain't got nothing. So they go on down to, to see what it is. That's why we sent John Glenn and them into space. That's why we tried to keep black people out of space until we realized if we don't send some black women into space, we ain't gonna know nothing. So we sent Mae Jefferson, we let Mae Jemison, we've got women into space. It's, 
because mm. the water and the space are the same. There, there's this evaporation and the, there's this yeah. thing going. I just think it's so exciting, you know, yeah. frankly speaking. And I know people like me, I mean, I'm 79, so I won't be here when we finally recognize that there, that inside ring on Jupiter mm. has life because there has to be a reason. It went through the two rings, and then we blew up the satellite. Remember, we, we blew up our satellite. And I think we blew it up because we know, not we, I didn't, but because we know that there is life in Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And we weren't ready for these people here mm -hmm. on Earth who can't get along with each other to find out that there's a life mm -hmm. at, at another planet. Mm -hmm. It would scare the shit out of, of Earth. Mm -hmm. So they just blew it up. But I'm, 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 I'm excited about that. I mean, some of you have grandchildren. They'll be, you know, calling me back, Grandpapa, <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Mars. And you say, oh, baby, I was in Mars when I was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, that, that arrogance of our age. Mm -hmm. But uh, space is there, and, and, and we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And we're not afraid that the black Americans mm -hmm. of all of the people on Earth are the people who are most prepared mm -hmm. to deal with a different, and I use my terms, Sincerely, there's nothing alien about the life we find in space because we deal with alien life here. Donald Trump, and I say that all the time, is an alien. That's an alien. And we can go back, Hitler was an alien. You know, we, we got aliens on Earth. So you know that we, we go up there. I saw you all had Uncle Henry's uh, liquor back there. You'd take, take a few bourbon bottles and, and go meet what's up there. Mm. Have a drink, man. <laughs> so you are. We're friendly. <laughs> Be you great. are. Um, Be great. When you look, so so let's say you were, um, you could see into the future. What would you want? What would you want to be true about all of us? I mean, I just love the collectivist. The way you talk about people is like it's all of us. What do you hope um, is true? for all of us and our thriving and our togetherness as a people? And what gives you hope that we'll get there? I wish us well. Mm -hmm. Let me start with that. And I said earlier, but it's true, I, 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 um, I know I can't change Earth. And so my job is to make sure Earth doesn't change me. I don't mm -hmm. want to be a part mm -hmm. of some of these people, no matter what. I would have to do to not be a part of it. I wouldn't, uh, I was reading, which makes me sad and I don't want to be sad, but I was reading, uh, James Baldwin did a, a, a bunch of interviews with the civil rights people, and you know how long ago, 60, 70 years ago. And um, one of the people he, that he interviewed was the, the gentleman who had worked with Fannie Lou Hamer. And he was talking about, because you remember when they, they shouldn't say remember because you probably don't, some of you are too young, but they, they, not the bus in 64, but before that when she was going around, they, they, they grabbed her and uh, took her to prison. And it was two, uh, two men, two black men in prison. And they said, either you beat her or we'll beat you. I mean, it was one of those. And so Miss Hamer was like, you know, go on, do what you have to do, because Miss Hamer was one of those, go on, do what you have to do. You can read this. Uh, you can look it up under James Baldwin in, in the interviews. And they did, they, they beat her. And I said to my son, we were talking about it, he's a lawyer. And I said, Thomas, I wouldn't be here, and it's true. I, I'm not gonna do your dirty work. Y if you want her beaten, I, I may not be able to stop you, mm. but I'm not gonna do it for you. Mm. And there are a lot of things that I'm not gonna do for other people. I'm just not gonna do their dirty work. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's so, I don't know how to say, that's just so basic. And if that's all I can do, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. If my last, thought on earth is, well, I didn't do your dirty work. Mm. I'm going to be happy with myself because that's all mm. I could do. Mm. And I, I have done then the best that I could do because yeah. I didn't do what I knew I shouldn't. Well, not, not just shouldn't, but I don't, I don't want to do your dirty work. Mm. And I think that I like people okay, but as I said, you know, fear is a good thing. Mm. And so you always have to be careful. You know, if my dog doesn't like somebody, she's a little dog, but if she's gonna growl at you, I know this person, I need to get rid of them. Something wrong, if, if, if Cleopatra don't want them around, something wrong with them, <laughs> you get rid of them. Because your dog knows. 
you got to listen to your dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you have to listen to your dog. But uh, I, I just think that all I want for all of us is the best that we can be. And I think it's a good idea. You wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, or at least, you know, some people brush their teeth at night, and I never did understand that. Because what are you doing? I don't. You're getting ready to go to bed. You know, what are you going to do with your teeth? You know, you go to bed, you're going to sleep and snore or something. But uh, I just know you wake up and you brush, and you're looking in a mirror and you brush your teeth. And I think the first thing you need to say, you need to smile and say, I love you. Because mm -hmm. it may be the only time you hear, I love you today. Oof. And it, it'll start your day off right. Because you start your day off knowing somebody mm -hmm. loves me. Ooh. And I wish that for, for all of us. Because there should be, and I like black Americans for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our faults, and I'm not, I'm not blind. But I like the fact that somehow we keep finding joy. And nobody understands why we can still find some joy somewhere. We, yeah. it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And people, if they could peel us apart, you know, just like, I'm going to find what makes those Negroes joyful, mm -hmm. you know. Because they, 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 they finally found out they can't beat it out of us. They can't mm -hmm. shoot it out of us. So mm -hmm. they, finally somebody's going to realize, oh, we should have peeled them mm -hmm. and find out what makes those people still be joyful. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think we're going to keep our joy no matter what else Oof. happens. I, I think that's what's important. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, woo. Okay. We're going to have folks ask you a little bit, a couple questions, if that's okay. Because this is, these are your people. These are your fans. And so we want to make sure that you are able to engage Nikki Giovanni in questions. I would say maybe three questions. Um, and so Tim is gonna go around and ask folk for their questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Carr. And I had a question, um, one of your favorite dialogues with uh, Mr. Baldwin. And you made a comment, you said, love is a tremendous responsibility. And you kind of startled him, I think, when you said it. And when I watched it, I'm like, man, I want to keep it real. But you don't want you want to lose somebody keeping it real. And I think what you said was so vulnerable. And I think that I just want to expound a little more about that. Um, love is a tremendous responsibility part about telling him a lie. He was like, he didn't want to lie. And you was like, you sure you can lie to me? Mm -hmm. You know, because you feel like you're going through so much as a black man, quote unquote, mm -hmm. that you have to have all these things. And you were like, kind of took the burden off of him by saying that, um, I, I don't know, I'll be honest. Yeah. 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 Well, one, I was thrilled that Mr. Bowman would have a conversation with me. Um, I hate to give long answers, which is why people don't ask me questions. But um, I worked with um, Ellis Hazlip on a PBS show called Soul, which was the forerunner to all of the rest of it. There are times, and I'm going to say this to the young people in the room, there are times when you get paid, and there are times when you don't. And I knew I was not going to have Ellis pay me, because then he could be finished. So I did, my, I was helping to co-produce some of the shows, put some of the shows together, but I didn't, I, I didn't work with him. So at the end of the year, Ellis owed me. Everybody knows I'm a foodie, so he was thinking, okay, she'll want to go to one of the great French restaurants, we're in New York, you know. And so Ellis came by the house, I, I had an apartment, and he came by and he said, well, you know, I owe you, I really owe you, Nikki, what, 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 what can I do? And I said, I'd love to talk to James Baldwin because that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't know that he knew me. He said, well, I know Jimmy. And I said, wow, you think he would talk to me? I mean, I'm 20 years younger than Jimmy at that point. And he said, I'll call him and I'll get back to you. And he did. And Mr. Baldwin said, oh, I'd love to talk to her, but I'm busy. And I can't, he lived, you know, Jimmy lived in St. Paul, Devance. And he said, I can't, I don't have time to come to the United States. Will she come to London? And you gotta be kidding, I would have walked in London. And so, <laughs> yeah. and so I did, and that's how I met Mr. Baldwin, who ultimately became Jimmy and a friend. But we were talking, and we were talking about lies. 
and the other place that you see it is in fences. Hmm? And I was so, if, if you know Algus Wilson, in fences, when, when he comes home and he tells her, his mistress, she makes me alive. And the wife says, you think this has been fun for me? I love mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And that is gonna come straight out of that conversation with, with Jimmy. And Jimmy was saying, you know, a man has to put food on the table, he has to put, pay the rent, I think is what he said. And I said, no, he goes out and he lies to people who dislike him and comes home and takes it out on me. Mm -hmm. He needs to take it out on them. And it doesn't matter whatever else happened, you know, so that's what, and he went, because it was, it surprised him that, uh, that, that, that I looked at it that way. But uh, I, I, I can't, I can't add to the past. Okay, so that, it was, it was a pleasure to get that, I haven't looked at, at that show, by the way, but I remember that conversation, I remember that part of it, and I remember his expression, because it never occurred to him that you are smiling at people you hate mm. and bringing that, not hatred, but certainly dislike. You're bringing the, I think I used the term here, you're bringing the dirt that you should have left you're bringing it home to me. I'm trying to put some food on the table. I'm trying to smile at you. I'm trying to say, honey, we're gonna make it through. And you're upset and it's Friday night and so you hit me instead of hitting the man mm -hmm. that you wanna, that you wanna hit. Cause I'm not the one that's not trying to, I'm not the one trying to make you less than who you should be. Mm -hmm. So why take it out? You can't take it out on me, it's got mm -hmm. to stop. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that that's what I was trying to say to Baldwin about how I think that um, men and women should get along. I, I think that uh, you, you gotta stop blaming, you gotta stop wanting somebody who hates you to love you and not appreciating or understanding somebody who loves you. <laughs> you, you just gotta stop that and, and, and I don't know, I don't know how that's gonna stop. I really, yeah. I really don't, but on any, on any Friday or Saturday night, some man is beating his wife and all she was doing is trying to keep a house together, trying to have a clean room for him, trying to put some hot food on the table. And he's upset because that son of a bitch he worked with had called him a nigger. And instead of telling him, you know, don't talk to me that way, he brings it home to his wife or his girlfriend or whatever it is he's screwing, whatever it is, he brings it home to somebody who was trying to be his friend. And I just wanted to bring that to Jimmy's attention because Jimmy's a smart man, mm -hmm. and he knows I'm not. He knows enough to not try to justify. Or as I was talking about those two men who beat Miss Hammer, see, yeah. they were going to be dead anyway. Yeah. They, they're not going to live a long life. The same people, the same jailers who were standing there watching them beat Fannie Lou Hamer are going to one day, and not all that long, kill them because they enjoy watching somebody. So don't, you don't do their dirty work. Let, let them do their own dirty work. Take this off. Thank you so much. My name is Ashley Devon Williamson. I am a product of the AME Church. I was a church poetry kid and I'm still a poet, and I find my purpose in that work in letting you know my ancestors speak through me, speaking truth to power, and journeying to those places that other people aren't necessarily brave enough to journey and explore. And in your conversation tonight, you talked a lot about, you know, don't worry about what other people are saying or doing, don't let that get to you. Um, I'm getting ready to pursue writing academically. And in reality, we do face these institutions that, you know, enforce a number of things against black bodies, against black minds. And my question, I guess, is advice for me, and maybe it'll speak to other people in the room. What do you say to yourself when you are mired in those places of you know, the poem hasn't fully come out of you yet onto the paper. Maybe you're trying to, you know, fulfill a contract with someone else, you know, get approval by your publisher, but you need the truth to come out. 
and you just aren't sure, you know, how do you, what do you say to yourself in those moments? Well, I think uh, now you have to realize we're talking maybe 50 years difference. And uh, it, it, it's really always funny to hear 50 years difference, but uh, it was a different, I grew up in a different world. And um, I don't think I'm arrogant, but I know that I'm indifferent. And so the first book that I did, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to think anybody would want to publish a book by a young black woman. I think I was 25, 26 year old. Who's going to want to publish by? So I, I didn't want to bother myself with something that I don't like losing. And the best way to avoid losing is you don't engage. And so what I did was uh, I went to the village and I found a printer and I, I found out, you know, what would it cost? And this is always a good question because now it's more. What would it cost to have 100 books printed? You know, and it was one of those things. And I found a printer and he was saying, well, you know, and he was trying to help me, you know, well, maybe we could get it done for $100. And that, it, it couldn't be now, it'd probably be $500, something like that. And I said, okay, because anybody, I shouldn't say anybody, but you can raise $100. I mean, you, you know, it's just one of those things you can do. Mm -hmm. And so I got that and there was a, a, a Detroit festival going on. And so I took them, my books too, I, I had a little Volkswagen, I drove up to Detroit and I sold the books for a dollar. Now, you can't make any money selling books for a dollar. Everybody knows that. Everybody in this room knows that. But now that I had the plates, I could get the next hundred dollars, uh, next hundred books for 50. It would only cost me $50. So I'm going to make $50. And I will say this to anybody in the room in business, I don't care what the business is, separate your business from your personal finance. Mm -hmm. Do that. Just make yourself do that. Any of your friends that want to borrow money, any of your, none of that, get rid of all of them. <laughs> no, because they're no good, you'll go broke. You'll be like almost everybody else. You'll find yourself broke, and all of a sudden they're not around anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, what does the song say? They don't come around anymore, they gone. Mm -hmm. And so separate that. So now I had 100 books that only cost me $50, so I could sell. And so I can now continue that roll over and of course, gas was you know, 70 cents or a gallon or something. So you know, you could drive around the country and do that. And I didn't, I wasn't, and, and I said that somebody said buy or something. I'm not, in, I, I, I wouldn't ask, if I was selling something, which I'm not selling anything here that I know of, I'm not asking anybody. Well, I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if it, Mercantile is selling, but I don't know. I don't think but so. I, I don't, um, it, it's just not something that I do. But I have them, and if you do, if, if I was, if this was a festival, I would be sitting at my table, you, I wouldn't ask you, you'd buy me, you don't. And I'm not like, ooh, but I am like, this is what I have and this is what, what I'm offering. And I hope that I can do it. And so you, you keep working at it because I believe in the best that I can do. I write better today as I sit here than I wrote 50 years ago but I have always believed in writing my best. And so if you ask me, if I wrote it back, that was the best poem I could write 50 years ago. And as I learned more about what I was looking at and what I was seeing, painters do the same thing. A, a good friend of mine just died recently, uh, Ashley Bryant. And Ashley could just look, he would look at you all and he would find something and he would paint the best that he could paint. You, there's always something going on, and there's always something going on uh, uh, writing-wise. And so what you have to, what anybody, this is just good advice, which I, I don't recommend, but it's good advice nonetheless. You have to write what you believe in, what's important to you. So as a black writer, somebody said, well, you didn't write about slavery. Well, maybe you're not interested in slavery. Maybe you want to write about your grandmother sitting on the front porch. You have to write about what you want. That, that, that's, it's you and it's your work. And as I say, and, and I can guarantee that, any writer will always know that nobody's gonna have any attention paid to them until they're dead. So you may as well go, writer, all of writers always dead. I'm telling yeah. you the truth. And, and so once you put that in your, once you understand, okay, then you go ahead. You're not making a television show. You're not making some stupid movie. I would be embarrassed if I had made, written, well, I won't, I won't say that. Say it. Say it. Speak it. Because that's mean to say. But 
<laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. But there are just some things that, just some things I wouldn't do. And somebody said, well, if you would do that, because people like me have heard it, you know, they take you out to dinner and say, well, why don't you write about? And I like French food, and my favorite is Italian, and so I don't mind, as I said, I, I didn't drink until I was, actually almost until my mother was dead, and so, because my father was an alcoholic. And I would sit there and I would eat with them, but I, I didn't need anybody to tell me why don't I. And so I would have dinner or lunch or whatever was being offered, and I would say thank you and I'd go on and do what I was doing, which they could take or leave. Mm. It's not, my life is nobody's business. And the reason I got along with my mother is that she recognized that. I did not want her opinion, and she did not want mine. So she stayed with my father, who I thought was crazy, and I stayed, and we're happy. We were ha the reason we got along is that we never gave, and if I hate, as I sit here before you, I hate an opinion. If I wanted an opinion, I would have asked. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way about you. If you want an opinion, you would ask me. So I'm trying to answer a question. But it's, it's all you've got is your life. And all your life has are words. And if you let people put words into this life, there's no you left. Mm. There's no you there. It's true. it's true. So you don't worry about it. Go on and do what you do and be happy. Mm. And then you'll be surprised all of a sudden it works. <laughs> Beautiful words of inspiration. Thank you, Nikki Giovanni. Right. sit here if you like. Um, we, stay put everybody, we're not done yet. I think y'all know it's about to be a party. But before we get there, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to turn it over to Cincinnati and Mercantile Library Poet Laureate, Yaley Kamara. Good evening, everyone. How are y'all doing? Good. It is such a pleasure to be here and to share a few poems and um, to be in the same space uh, with Nikki Giovanni and with all of you. And thank you, Urban Consulate, for this invitation. Um, Nikki Giovanni, Ms. Nikki Giovanni, has been with me since uh, my girlhood in Oakland, California a poet who meant a lot to me growing up, and also um, someone who I got to teach uh, in my classes, so it's wonderful to now be in the same space as um, a, her a heroine that's been with me since girlhood, so thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Um, when I think about black joy, liberation, and expression, I think about my mother. I think about archiving memories of my mother, so I'm just going to read two poems about my mother, Agatha Kamara, who is my first poet, um, and she's a Sierra Leonean woman who lives in Oakland, California. So this first, rule, this first poem is called Mother's Rules, and it's uh, things my mother said to me in my lifetime. All of it is true. Um, my mom is usually right. I don't always tell her that, though. So this is a poem for my mother. Mother's Rules. One, if you see me praying in the living room, never sit in front of me. You are not God. Two, when we go to a restaurant and I don't know any foods on the menu, never order me a meal that is spelt with silent letters. I came to eat, not to explore. Three, you didn't make food, no, God did. You cooked food, watch your English, watch your faith. Four, your Creole is offensive. When you speak, you sound like Shaba Ranks. Your accent is, okay, we got the Shaba Ranks fans in here. Your accent is funny, but keep practicing. It is the only way we'll be able to gossip in peace while at the supermarket. Five, try to learn the language of your lover and his family. They could be smiling to your face and getting ready to trade you for six goats and three mules during your first trip to the homeland. 
Six, if anyone stares at you for too long, more than five seconds, start speaking an imaginary language while maintaining eye contact, they will be the first to look away. That rule really works. <laughs> Seven, consider the consequence of purchasing human hair wigs, secondhand clothing, and used furniture. Maybe you will feel beautiful and also save money, but you never know whose bad luck or misfortune will be sitting on your head, body, or in the home in which you sleep. Buy what you can truly afford. Eight, your father's Muslim, so you are too. 1989 to 1993. I am Christian, so you are too. 1993 to 2012. I am Catholic now, but you keep praying. 2012 to present. Nine, you laugh at me now, like I laughed at my mother, like she laughed at hers, like your daughters will laugh at you, and I will live long enough to forgive your folly. 10, just make sure to pray, amen. This second poem um, is called Be Seydu, and it's based on experience my mother and I had many years ago in Oakland. It was a memory that stuck with me for many years, and I was just finally able to get it out a few summers ago. Be Seydu. While sipping coffee in my mother's Toyota, we hear the bird call of two teenage boys in the parking lot. I, one says, Be Seydu, the other returns as they reach for each other. Their cupped handshake pops like the first fat firecrackers of summer. Their fingers shimmy as if they're solving a Rubik's Cube just beyond our sight. Moments later, their Schwinn's head in opposite directions. My mother turns to me, revealing the milky John Waters mustache-thin foam on her upper lip. Waiting them bise, bise do, na English, she asks, tickled by this tangle of new language. All right, be safe, dude. I pull apart each syllable like string cheese for her. Oh yeah, dem na wil padi. She smiles, surprisingly broken by the tenderness expressed by what half my family might call thugs. Be say do, be say do, be say do. We chirp in the car, then nightly into our phones after I leave California. Be say do, she says, as she softly muffles the rattling of my bones in newfound sobriety. Be say do, I say years later, her response made raspy by an oxygen treatment at the ER. Be say do we whisper to each other across the country, like some word from deep in a somewhere too newborn pure for the outdoors, but we saw those two boys do it in broad daylight under a decadent ruinous sun. Be say do, be say do, we say, be say do, and split one more for the road, for all the struggle, tumble, drown. Be say do, we say, to get on the good foot. We get off of the phone, tight like the bulbous air of two palms that have just kissed. Thank you all so much. Yaley, thank you so much for those powerful and moving words. Um, I want to invite all of you to stay with us after we close out tonight's program. Guys, as I said before, this is a celebration, so we will have the bar continue to be open. We'll have DJ Ari up there spinning, and we're going to just turn this into a celebration afterwards, right? Um, but before I close out, <clears throat> I'd like to take a couple moments to recognize someone very special to the Urban Consulate. And essentially, this person was very crucial to this evening's celebration, Naima Bilal. For the past six months, I've had the pleasure of working with and learning from Naima, and for the past three years, we've all had the pleasure of watching her host over 100 change makers and community builders for experiencing and cultivating conversation here in Cincinnati. Naima has done a beautiful job of hosting community, but more importantly, creating space to learn, heal, and build through conversation. And how fitting that on today, her show Equity in Education was nominated for an Emmy, guys. An Emmy. <laughs> the vision of tonight's program was truly Naima's dream. And Naima, we thank you. We appreciate you, and we love you forever, your Urban Consulate family. <laughs>